Evening, everybody. Welcome. So, yeah, this is Super Collider Week 14. This is going to be the last live stream lecture of the semester. And uh, tonight I thought I'd talk about um, two concepts we haven't really covered yet. Uh, one of them is integrating Super Collider with uh, DAWs. Um, specifically using MIDI and passing MIDI from Super Collider to some to your DAW of choice. Um, and uh, it's possible to also route audio back and forth. I haven't really prepared for that uh, tonight, so we're just going to focus on MIDI. But uh, I've got a tutorial on this as well, tutorial 18, which is MIDI part 2. covers basically the same stuff that we'll talk about tonight. Um, and the other topic, uh, for better or worse, I am going to try to dabble in a little bit of live coding. Live coding being uh, doing everything on the fly, sort of blurring the distinction between composer and performer. And, you know, just sort of typing it all out and making sounds and modifying your processes in real time. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. I'm not an expert in live coding. I've been sort of watching a few videos and picking up on a few things over the past week or so. And, you know, we'll see. It may not be the most useful or practical video in the world. So, yeah. So, hey, everybody. Hey, Pierre. Um, let's, do a, let's do a sound check. And you can let me know if you can hear my pink noise. Awesome. Awesome, thanks. Okay, um, let's start from uh, start from scratch here, and so we'll start with DAW integration. Um, so I've got Logic. We're gonna open up Logic. Another another complicated thing about streaming, uh, routing audio from Super Collider to Logic is it's kind of um, it's kind of a virtual signal flow nightmare because I've got OBS and I just it's just I don't know I'd have to do some thinking about it so all right try to cram all this on one screen um, I'm gonna just make a software instrument track running sculpture and you know I actually haven't tested the audio from logic let's see if we can hear anything <laughs> So I I see that coming into uh yeah cool okay so this is a physical modeling synth that comes with logic I think it's pretty cool It's going to try to find something nice and short and punchy to work with Maybe I do let's see can we I guess we'll stick with that for now. I kind of want something that can sustain. Could mess around with this all day. All right. Um, good stuff. So, right, this is a, a MIDI driven um, physical modeling plugin, synthesis plugin. And normally you just grab your MIDI controller and play MIDI into it, but we're actually going to use Super Collider to throw MIDI virtually on a virtual MIDI cable over to Logic. Um, so the first thing we need to do is connect all MIDI devices. Now I've got two connected. You can see I've got two sources and two destinations. Um, now if you're trying this at home and if you're on Mac, the, before you run MIDI in .connect all, actually, you want to jump over to your audio MIDI setup utility 
and view your uh look at the MIDI studio. And there's something here called IAC driver inter application communication is what that stands for. You want to double click on it and you just want to make sure uh devices online is checked. And this is like a virtual bus where you can send and receive MIDI. So because devices online is checked, we see it as a source and as a destination. And you also want to configure whatever DAW you're working in to receive MIDI uh, on that device, that virtual device. I think right now Logic is just listening for any incoming MIDI data. So we already know, we've covered in previous videos, pre previous lectures, we can do uh, MIDI def dot note on dot cc dot whatever uh, to receive certain MIDI messages and then evaluate a function in response. But we're not going to be receiving MIDI. We're going to be sending MIDI. And the first step here is to create a new instance of a class called MIDI out. And MIDI out dot new takes two arguments, but really we only need one. It's a port number, and this corresponds to the um, position of the device you care about in the array returned by MIDI client dot destinations. You can see we've got an array here, and the first, the, the zeroth item is uh, the IAC driver, and the one after that is my nano control that I've got over here. And so we want the IAC driver that has index zero. So we say MIDI out dot new zero. And we evaluate this line. And now that we have an instance of MIDI out, we can actually send messages to it with m dot note on. Um, and then if we scroll down to MIDI out, we can see the arguments are channel, note number, and velocity, the three ingredients that make up a MIDI note on message. So MIDI channels are, uh, we think of those as 1 to 16. Super Collider thinks of those as 0 to 15. Um, so you just have to keep that in mind. I'm going to send this on the lowest numbered MIDI channel. And we'll do middle C, which is note number 60, and a velocity. We can do 64. We'll just go with the defaults here. And we hear sound. And because this sound does not sustain, it's not easy to demonstrate what's what's actually going on here. If, I think if we look over in Logic and open the, uh, let's see. Yeah, let's keep that open, that keyboard, and we're going to send another note. And you can see the, well, I this this would normally be ASDF whatever QWERTY is, G, H, J, K, L, semicolon, but I have a different keyboard layout, so this is my home row. And the the musical keyboard, it's like, it thinks I'm holding down the T key, and I'm just holding this middle C because I've sent a note on, but I haven't sent a note off. So let's do M dot note off. And then here we need to, again, specify channel, the note number, and we can specify a release velocity if we want, or we can omit this value, it doesn't really matter. So we'll run that and now the T key is no longer being pressed down. Right. And I think there's actually a little bit of latency here, at least on my end. I think you should see that as well. And MIDI out objects have a default latency value of 0.2. I'm not really sure why, but I'm going to set this to zero. And now this should be more or less instantaneous. Yeah. Okay, but I want to pick a different sound over in Sculpture that actually sustains instead of, uh, right now, it's, this one's not quite working. So let's go to like, um, I don't know, bowed instruments. We'll do ambient, slow bow. Hopefully this sounds kind of nice. So, right. So now, uh, let's go back to Super Collider. And if we do note on, it just stays stays on. Right. Uh, we have to actually turn it off. 
right? It's like we press a key, we release a key. And uh, so that's the basics of node on and node off. We can now uh, make something a little bit more sophisticated. Make a routine with a, a loop. And we'll say var note. Uh, note equals some random MIDI note number. Of course, if you're familiar with MIDI, you probably know that uh, note and velocity values have to be between 0 and 127, because these are 7-bit values we're talking about. So um, I'm not really sure what happens if you send a value less than 0 or greater than 127. I don't think I've ever tried that. Uh, and we'll say m.note on 0 note. Uh, I don't know, random velocity between 20 and 90. Uh, and then we will, uh, I forgot a parenthesis. Okay, here we go. Um, wait for half a second or half a beat, whatever that is. And then we'll do a uh, note off message. And we'll wait for another half second. <laughs> On my layout, the R is next to the L. So sometimes I'm typing in, oh, I hope this works. But no, play is what we want. So now. Right, so it just runs. We've got a, a routine over here, and we can stop it whenever we like. And we've just captured that lovely algorithmic MIDI data. Uh, if we wanted to do chords, I guess we could do... We will say, uh, you know, put this in curly braces and say exclam four. And then we will uh, iterate over that. And we'll turn the note on. Let's keep it low. We'll just do a velocity of 30 because we have multiple notes going on here. Oh, Pierre, I think you're right. Um that sounds that sounds right anyway. Yeah, that the there's a default sort of server latency and yeah, it's a consistency thing. Um let's do this two dot wait and oh you know I what am I doing? Uh yeah, we'll turn all four of those notes on, wait for two seconds, and then note dot do again. Uh, turn them off, and we'll wait for, uh, we need arg n, close out the iteration, and then wait for one second. And that seems fine, right? Oh, something's wrong here. Hmm, I got an error message. Send MIDI out, failed. What does this give us? Uh-huh, pass the value in, note on, do dot wait, note dot do, dot note off. Oh, ha ha, that is not supposed to be note supposed to be n I don't know if there's a panic button on sculpture I just thought it was it would be easiest to just uh kill it so I guess we have to go back to our our whatever what do we do boat instruments this one turn it down a little bit I don't know why the default is up so high 
Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So I guess it got confused at the note offs, which is why it never actually turned them off. So this should be better. Ah, and I, I stopped it. Turn this down for a second. Yeah, yeah, I, I stopped the routine during this wait here. So it had turned notes on, but now the notes are still going. So, um, you know, we, we don't really know which notes they are because we didn't post LN anything. But if we want to turn them off, we can just do um, every note number dot do arg n m dot note off zero n and this will just send a rapid fire 128 note off messages yeah yeah and that's a well uh i don't think so and parmar uh we could try it like let's Let's just uh, do this. So we'll turn some notes on. And then here are the notes right over here. So, um, I mean, we have to send the note off message to the instance of MIDI out. So we maybe could try something like, like that, but I don't think this is gonna work. No, it needs a number here. So the best way to do it is to iterate over this array, or better yet, just iterate over all note numbers and do it that way. Um, yeah, I uh, unfearing, I do that in tutorial 18. The What I end up doing is I use the command period object, uh, which you can register functions to be evaluated whenever you press command period. So you would do something like this. I think. And so now, uh, am I doing this right? What's command period dot add? Yeah, you add, is there an example just to make sure I'm doing this right? Yeah, f is a function and we add it. So if I do that, then if I play some notes and press command period, it should stop them. Oops, I need to, so here's command period. Yeah, that's really handy. I highly recommend doing that. So this is, if there's anything else you want to happen when you press command period, this is the way to do it. You just create a function and add it. And yeah, handy stuff. Yeah. Um, so one thing I don't really like about this is that if, let's let's just, um. Imagine we want to change this routine. Well, okay, let's start with scale dot minor pentatonic, because who doesn't like a good minor pentatonic scale? As degrees, this gives us what zero, three, five, seven, ten. Yeah, da 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 da. And we'll add fifty. That gives us a D minor pentatonic scale, and we will uh, add a random value between zero. Uh, ch we'll choose, sorry, we'll choose either zero or 12, and we're going to add that. We're going to, how am I going to do? Okay, so. I, what I want to do is just pick from a pentatonic scale and then make an array out of that. So uh, so this gives us one of those scale degrees. We add 50, and then we possibly transpose it up an octave. That looks correct to me. And then we're just going to exclaim 4 on that. So... You know, now we've got minor pentatonic scale.
Okay. I won't mess around with that too much. I'll, I will resist the urge to tweak the synthesis parameters. But anyway, what the, the point I'm trying to get at here is if we want to change this routine, I'm, I'm sort of starting to transition into the live coding topics here. It's a, it's a global variable R. And, um, yeah, we've got... So if we, say, want to make it... Like, uh... We'll transpose it, you know, down... A perfect fifth, or something, right? So this will just take every number and subtract seven. And if we do this, though... We sort of mess things all up here. Because now we actually have two routines running, and we've overwritten the second... We've overwritten the first one with the second one. So now R refers to this new routine, which is minus seven. And if we stop it... And you can hear some of the... some There's some overlap in the notes that we might choose in the first and second routine. And some of them are, like, getting cut off early or something. So if we stop this, we only stop one of them. And now we have to do command period or, or something. And it's nice that we have command period at our disposal. So this is not the optimal object to use if you want to be able to make adjustments in real time. Uh, there is, I guess what I would go for is something called tdef. This is uh, the, it's a, it's like the class task, which is similar to routine, um, but it is sort of the live coding version of it. And it's like a, it keeps a reference to a task and you can edit the tdef and the task updates in the background, but you can change the definition of that task and how it, what's inside of it um, and change it while it's running and it'll change seamlessly. So the syntax here is a little bit different. Uh, we do tdef, we give it a symbol name, just like synthdef and mididef, so we'll call this just t0, and, and I think we just, we just play it this way. So now maybe we can make these shorter, something like this, and now if I just reevaluate it, uh, that's pretty quiet, but you can hear that we've changed it without overwriting it. We've overwritten something, but we didn't create a new thing. We didn't create any sort of conflicts. We just have this one thing, this tdef named t0, and we can just overwrite it whenever we want. Let's go back to uh, a different sound here. Let's go to... Uh... Yeah. I like that. I'm happy with that. So... Let's go back up to our original transposition. And we'll speed it up a little bit.
And now I'm just sort of tinkering. Alright, that went pretty well. I'm kind of happy with that. The trick is to just get into a flow and, I don't know, not, not think about it too much. So that was fun. And I recorded all that. Whoa! That didn't look right. I guess I had some stuck notes. That's not quite what I was expecting to see. Uh, why would that have happened? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... Every time I reevaluated this, it, it starts over, and there's a chance that it'll be between note on and note off. So yeah, that's maybe not maybe not the best approach. Um, there needs to be some way of, of making sure that when the TDEF is updated, all of the notes get note off messages. I, I didn't notice it because this particular sound has a zero sustain level. So after the decay, it just goes away. It doesn't really matter if you're holding a key down physically or virtually. Um, so I, I do wanna, before we go dive sort of headfirst into live coding proper, um, I wanna mention that you can do this, it's probably a lot slicker to just do this with uh, pbind um, instead of tdef. I mean, tdef is great. Um, you just have to manage your note on and note off so you don't get stuck notes, cause like I just did, like a, like a buffoon. All right, so let's, let's uh, change gears here and let's get into pbind a little bit uh so um call this uh p0 now normally well if we don't specify otherwise the default type of event that pbind is going to generate are note events and note events uh synth is simply creates a synth on the server that's not what we want uh super collider the server is not even booted we're using logic as our synthesis engine. So we don't want to generate note type events. So we want to generate MIDI events. And I'm going to quickly jump over to uh, Streams Patterns Events and a practical guide. 
And I think there's a, what is it, eight or something event types? Yeah. Um, I think this is it. Right. So at the bottom, there are all these different types of events that you can make. And here is somewhere the note event. Right? This is the default event type. There's so many event types. And the event type for sending MIDI out is just simply MIDI. That's why I've put MIDI here. Um, so if we do, um, we, we need to, here are the keys. Well, we always need a door, right? We always need to know how long to wait before generating the next event, regardless of type. So, and you know what I'm going to do here? Before we get real into it, I'm going to do make a tempo clock. And we'll do 108 beats per minute. And we will make this permanent. It's a permanent tempo clock. And I'm going to schedule the following function on the next bar, which is going to say t.beats.postln. And we'll reschedule this every four beats. So what this says is we're scheduling the following function on an absolute time in beats, and that time is the next bar. Right? So if I run it now, it would be 56. Now the next bar is 60. And we're just going to post the current beat every four beats. So there we go, 68. It's, and this is running at 108 beats per minute. And I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to set my project tempo to be consistent with that, 108 beats per minute. Oh, and you know, before I forget, um, Windows users who uh, don't have you know, the IAC driver, I did a little hunting around, and I did find this thing which looks promising. It's a virtual MIDI uh, driver for Windows, which serves the same function. It, uh, the ability to dynamically create and destroy freely nameable MIDI ports. And I think this is free. Well, anyway, you can check that out. That's that's a, an option for. I try I try not to, I try not to ignore my Windows friends. So I try to be as as cross platform as I can, to the extent that I can. Anyway, so we've made this tempo clock, and now if we play this P bind on tempo clock T, uh, we're going to be thinking in terms of beats at 108 beats per minute. So this would be uh, a quarter note at 108 beats per minute. We'll start there. The other keys we need, now we don't need things like instrument and freak and amp. and I mean, uh, it, the keys are different because this is a different type of event. The first thing we need is the MIDI command, M-I-D-I-C-M-D. -I -I and the type of event is, uh, I think it's, is there a list here just to make sure? Yeah, available MIDI commands, note on. And if it's a note on MIDI, we also need uh, the MIDI out, the instance of MIDI out that we're using for sending these messages. That's M. And channel, we'll send this on channel zero. And OK, so note on, we've got channel. We need the MIDI note number, obviously. Um, let's start with 60 amp now this always confuses me a little bit but i think we're supposed to put values between zero and one midi velocity equals amp divided by 12. we'll start with i'm i'm i think we're supposed to think of this like we usually do in super collider with a value between zero and one we'll try this and sustain. Here's here's why it's great to use pbind. This is why I switched over to pbind from tdef. This is a value which determines how many beats to wait before sending the corresponding note off message. So we do not need to manage a second pattern, a second pbind responsible for turning off all the notes and chasing the first pattern and saying off, 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 off. Sustain does that for us. And we can subject it to our wonderful pattern library as well. So we'll say... Point two and has gate normally true. 
Uh, we want hasgate to be true because if it's false, we don't get the note off message. And I think that's all we need. So we can play this, I think. Yeah, and let's do, um, so we want, let's see, let's do 16th notes at 108 beats per minute. We'll keep the sustain really short. And we'll do a uh, PX Rand, scale, minor, pentatonic, degrees, plus 50. And we'll add to that a P Rand, 0, 12, 24. And we'll make this maybe a little quieter. I, ooh, not two decimal points. Just one, please. Thank you. All right. I, wait a minute. Oh, okay. I know why that happened. We only got one note. Right? Where are the rest of the notes? It's because PX Rand has a default... Well, I know it, it's not here. I know P Rand does. I think if we open up the parentheses here, you can see the default number of repeats is one. So we need to do inf. That's what I forgot to do. Now we're not using our tempo clock yet. This is just, that's actually, that's, those are values in seconds or uh, 16th notes at 60 beats per minute. So we actually need to play this on our tempo clock T. And because we made it permanent, we can command period all we want. And it still runs. It just got rid of that function, I think. It's still running. Yeah, it's still there. So if we play it on T and we can quantize it to the nearest multiple of four. So now it should start uh, in sync with one of these, and it'll also be faster than what we just heard because now we're, this is, these are a quarter of a beat at the tempo of this clock. It's a beautiful thing to watch. It's like a player piano, like a piano roll or something. Get back here. And again, we have the same problem we had before where we, if, if we sort of carelessly just run, like change something and run it again, we'll have two P binds running concurrently with the same name and the first one becomes inaccessible. So there are a couple ways around this. One of which I'm really, actually, I don't want to get too far into this, but I do want to mention it. There's a class called proxy space. This is an environment. It's a type of environment, but everything behaves as, as these sort of live coding friendly objects where, uh, you know, okay, so right now, if we say uh, variable test is equal to five, right? We've created an environment variable in the current environment. So if we say current environment, just, a, this is one of those special words like true and false and nil. Um, you can see we've got that global variable and our global variable p0, which is an event stream player because we played a pattern, played a p bind with it. Um, and let's stop the tempo clock. So we don't have those numbers piling up. So our current environment has two environment variables. We've been calling them global variables, test and p0. Now let's say we go uh, e equals environment environment dot new or dot make I think it is. So now, uh, no, maybe it's use. Forgetting this. Mm. Maybe it's push. Let's see, we still have test is five, yeah. Push.
Yeah, I, okay, well, let me skip over making an environment and we'll actually just do a proxy space instead. Um, I think we need to now do e.pop. And now do we have test again? Yeah, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm like 70% sure what's going on here. But uh, if we do uh, e equals proxy space dot push. Our current environment is now e instead of whatever it was before, which means test has is has the value of a node proxy. Everything is now a proxy for something. Uh, and so now if we do this, so let's make our temple clock and let's do this. And let's just uh, shift it up a half step. We'll know for sure right away if, um, if, if we'll have two overlapping patterns. So I think Huh, I don't think that worked. No. No, I don't think it worked. Okay. So, all right, forget about proxy space. I, I didn't do my homework, and I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand how it works. So, uh, let's go back to our current environment. So now test should be five again. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so the, the problem was was that I if we run this again, we we get a second concurrent pattern with the same name, and that's that's not what we want. Um, so the solution that we did up here was to use tdef, and we're going to use a similar pattern called pbindf. I think I might have touched on this briefly. We'll call it p0, and... That's all we need. So let's make our tempo clock and print our downbeats. So here, I think if we do this, it'll come in on beat 20. And now if we change it, you can hear this, we don't have that, uh, those clashing patterns anymore. It's simply replaced the first one with the other one. So replace the second one, replace the first one with the second one. Uh, yeah, okay, so all these def objects can have a fade time. So let's see how that works. No, just, okay, forget about fade time. That's not. I guess that's not working as I thought it would. I think I think the a better way to do this is to let's clear it. Let's just clear it out completely. And I think what I most frequently see in terms of live coding is uh we let's see, we say play it and we quant uh play it on clock T and quantize it to four. Is that an error message? No, it's not. <laughs> it looked kind of errory. International conference on live coding. What's going on right now? Oh, wow. Oh, that's awesome. And so now I think we just, we've already played it and quantized it. 
So if we do this, it should start on 296. Yeah. And so you can hear that when I when I make these changes, it's happening immediately. But I think we can also quantize these changes. So let me see. I'll reevaluate this right after a beat. Yeah, and then the change is quantized to the nearest multiple of four on the tempo clock. Oh man, I've been recording all of this. <laughs> Okay. Okay, uh, I guess last thing, let's stop this for a second. Uh, it's, it's nice to, I mean, this is not really a full DAW integration, but let's do something a little bit more sophisticated. And I'm going to uh, generate a pattern that uh, actually, we're going to map a MIDI control, a, uh, control change message to this thing here. Let's just see, does it make a significant change in the sound? That's what I want to know. I think it does. Well, that's nice. Okay. So the way that process works is, hey, Beetle. How's it going? Welcome. Uh, we want to uh, use the MIDI learn feature in your DAW, you know, wherever it is. So. Uh, I think in logic we just do command L and here's the object we care about. All right, this one here. So there's my MIDI learn. There it is. Make sure everyone can see. So it's this guy here and it's morph pointer zero. I or I think that's what, what it is, right? If we touch something else. Yeah. Object one morph pointer and now we just it's waiting for a message it's listening so we'll go into super collider and we'll say m dot control instead of m dot note on m dot control channel zero controller number 20 arbitrarily i think that's not a that's undefined in the midi protocol and we'll send it a value like 60 and there look look at that like magic just shows up control change channel one or channel zero 2060. So I think we just learned that. And it might it might need another one actually. I, I recall that it, it needed two messages. So we'll send it 60 and 61. Yeah, it needs you see it, it jumped there. You can like oh it's hidden behind the, the stupid chat. But the second value I sent it caused one to jump to a value corresponding to 61 on a scale of 0 to 127. And that's that's what we want. So now I think should be able to get in here and whoops. Uh so now let's send like a random between zero and one twenty seven. Yeah. See that? It's moving. Moving all by itself. 
All right, so with that done, now we can make another pattern, which uh, let's just copy some of this stuff, put it down here. Uh, where'd it go? So we'll say P1, play that one. It's initially empty. And then we're going to play it or give it, give it some content. It's going to be a control uh, type of message. And I need to remember what it is we're doing here. Uh, so control needs channel, CTL, capital N-U-M. Control number, that's control number 20. And control, the actual value. And we'll do pseek from 0 to 127 dot mirror. That gives us 0 to 127 and back again. It's not posting the whole thing, but I can take my word for it. And... That looks good. And we'll just have this be like pretty fast. This is like 64th notes. Maybe that's a little too fast. Do 1 12th of a beat. It's like 16th note triplets, I think. Um, so change these just so we don't forget. And let's play this. And is it moving? Yeah, look at that. It's just going going along. Let's start our other one. So it doesn't sound any different with longer sustain times. If it were a sustaining sound, we'd hear a difference because this, this sound does not have any sustain. It's just a decaying sound, but everything's working. And oh, let's, let's actually record our automation data. So we want to go into latch mode. And now if we look at the automate, oh, look, it's right there. <laughs> Let's do something else. Let's do a P white between zero and 127. Aha! <laughs> That's why they call it P white, because it looks like white noise. Slow it down a little bit. And you see how it's all nicely quantized? It may not be lining up with the downbeats in Logic, but that's kind of okay, because we can take the whole region and just nudge it so that the first note aligns with the downbeat and then the rest of it will be quantized. All right, that was kind of fun. Let's stop that tempo clock. All right, so I think that about wraps it up for DAW integration. Um, and I kind of have been doing a fair bit of live coding as well. I think all this kind of counts as live coding. Um, we just set up our objects and then we can change them on the fly and they're all nicely locked to a, a rhythmic grid. But I, I did prepare just a little bit more on live coding. So uh, there are two YouTube channels that I want to promote uh, because they have videos which I watched and I thought were really interesting and really helpful just to get a sense of what's going on. Oh yeah, so NParmar, I, I just, I made that up. I mean, there are, um, I didn't, it, Logic was just um, 
waiting for any control change message. And I arbitrarily picked control number 20. And uh, yeah, the way that works is in logic, I mean, we have some parameter that we want to control, like, you know, this knob here or something. And in logic, it works differently in other DAWs, but you just, like, sometimes you right click on it. But here we do a command L, and this is the auto map function for logic. And level is the last thing I touched. Um, you can touch other things, like, you know, if I touch wet level for the delay, then, well, anyway, it's, let's see, can we close this for a second? Yeah, delay wet level, delay feedback, cross feed. All these things are mappable. And all I need to do now is just uh, send a control change message from Super Collider. And whatever message I send, I can pick I can pick my controller number. It can be anything between zero and one twenty seven. That's what it chooses to map to that parameter. So once we learn that and close this, all of those messages with that particular controller will will control it. So yeah, what I ended up doing, I just said uh where did I do it? Yeah, right here. I uh, I just sent two messages, this one, and then Logic, for whatever reason, needs a second one to just confirm that that's the one you want. So this is controller number 20, a value of 60, followed by the same controller, value of 61. And that's enough for Logic to say, okay, got it. And any any subsequent control change messages you send will control that thing that you adjusted. So, All right, uh, I think I'm going to quit out of Logic. I could save this, but why? I don't know. It's just, it's just like, just random stuff. Like, I always feel a little guilty just abandoning. Oh, that's a long stuck note. Went on for quite a while. Um, I think if you're if you're doing this and like uh, algorithmically generating some MIDI pattern, uh, you can you can sort of half expect to have to clean it up afterwards. I mean, this is sloppy. Like, don't expect that. But like. Maybe like the last note will just be this really long one and you'll have to go in and, you know, shorten it yourself or something. Oh, that's down here, right? Anyway, so let's get out of logic here. Ugh. All right, so I was going to uh, just mention these two channels. The first one... Uh, is a YouTube user by the name of uh, Buell Paran, B-Y-U-L-P-A-R-A-N, and he's got a video, Super Collider Live Coding. And yeah, it's, I, it's, it's pretty straightforward. He uses this approach where he's got uh, an impulse generator at the top of the, as, as, as sort of a clock. He's just Checking out impulses, and uh, and then he just reads those in. I'll I'll see if I can simulate something like that. And uh, anyway, that's that's this is a pretty good video. It's it's a solid live coding session. It's kind of interesting to listen to, and it's it's always kind of instructive. The other is uh, Ryan Kirkbride. His username is Dynamite Bananas, and he's got quite a lot of interesting stuff. If you go to his videos, uh, at the early on, he's live coding with Super Collider. So I watched a few of these early videos and lately it looks like he's been getting into something called Fox Dot, which is, um, you can look that up. It's, uh, it, I think it uses Super Collider, but it's, uh, it's a separate syntax, um, which, I mean, like, you know, Sonic Pi and Fox Dot and Tidal Cycles, they're all really very much meant for live coding. And so the syntax is modified in such a way that you can express yourself musically in a remarkably few number of characters like you know less less than what we're doing here this is fairly short and if you know what you're doing it's pretty quick but i think you know there are, there are live coding languages which i think are more concise so now he's doing all sorts of stuff with with fox dot but these these videos at the bottom here are, are worth watching i think um right so let me just get my notes real quick live coding tests to so 
the way I see it, if you want to do some live coding, uh, you you may want to. Now we're going to be using Super Collider as our synthesis engine, so um, we're going to have to make some synth depths. And I'll try to keep it real simple here. In the spirit of live coding, I'm going to name my synth depths single letters, for better or worse. Uh, so we'll give ourselves a frequency, um, amplitude, maybe a pan position, and we'll say var. Three, yeah. Let's do um, the first YouTube user I showed, um, Buell Paran. He was using uh, an oscillator called Phase Modulation OSC, PM OSC. This is just a quick way of getting frequency modulation sounds. Uh, let's say. Oh wait, you know what? Oh, we don't need to make synth depths. What am I doing? Um, that's we can just cram them into uh, this object that I want to introduce, right? Um, maybe I should have saved that code, but that's well. Let's type it again. So ndef is like synth def and midi def and t def and p bind def and all these def objects, in that it keeps a reference to. Uh, a node proxy, um, or it, it's uh, basically it, it's the same thing as as p bind f. So we can go ahead right now. Um, let's see. The first first thing I wanted to do was uh, well, I want I want I'm going to follow that uh, uh, Bayul Paran's uh, idea here, and we'll make a clock and f. So we will say um, fade time zero. So just start immediately. Uh, dot play and there it is it's running it's currently empty but we'll uh, fill it with something and let's make a um, beat bus we don't need this to be an audio bus this can be a control bus in just one channel it's just we're gonna we're gonna send out audio or control rate impulses and so now we'll say end f clock it's going to be impulse. Uh, I think we do say out dot kr beat bus impulse dot kr, and you know we need some tempo BPM. Let's do one oh eight again. So I think here we just do BPM over sixty because this is frequency. Yeah, so as BPM increases, we want the frequency to increase. It's going to be, yeah, I think this will be quarter notes at 108. Yeah. So, uh, right. I think that's all we need. And I guess let's let's pull this. No, 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 no. Let's just trust that it's working. If we look at the node tree, you can see it's it's done some stuff here. It's not really clear what's going on here, but we do have something called clock. So um, yeah, I think I think everything's running. And now let's see, we can make uh, now we got to make some sort of sound here. Let's start with uh, and F A. Um, we'll play this. Oh, you know, I wanted to give it a fade time. Let's clear that. Fade time three seconds. Let's try to keep it sort of simple here. Right. And that's what I want, I think. Right, Pierre? Uh, because if it was 60 over 60, that would be 1, which is 1 impulse per second. So that would be quarter notes at 60 beats per minute. If this was 120, that would be 2, so 2 impulses per second. So, yeah, I think that's what I want. Um...
So now we're just more or less making a synth def here. Uh, um, you know what, let's just start with a sine wave. Why not? I'm just going to, let's make sure we get sound first of all. Um... So we'll say done action zero, but uh, the gate will be in dot kr beat bus. So we're going to be reading from this bus. Oh, I should I should do this. This is this is better. Maybe trig is a better word than gate in this case. But we're going with gate for better or worse. Uh, sig equals sig times env. We'll also And I don't think we need an out statement here. Endf sort of takes care of that for us. Um, when we play a node proxy or an endf, No, it's already playing. It's already playing. So I this should this should work. Yeah. And you can hear that it faded in over three seconds. And so now we can do, you know, just change change some value here. And there's a nice crossfade for us. So maybe we'll take this away. Declare a variable. Uh, we'll go back to MIDI notes. And let's change our clock. This might make things out of sync temporarily, but uh, let's make another bus, because maybe I want some 16th notes in here. Make another bus for ourselves. I'll say div bus. We want four times BPM over 60. So this is going to be four impulses in the space of one. Yeah. So it did make a little skip there. Um, and so now if I do give bus, now it's going to read from the other bus. Put some values in here. Zero, zero point five, one, minus one. So we can't really put patterns inside of an endf. That doesn't quite make sense. But there are some unit generators that work. So we can do t choose dot kr. And every oh uh yeah 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 this put this below the gate here. Uh, yeah, so T choose, we got to give it a trigger, which is going to be gate. So every every one of these impulses, it's going to pick a new value. So we can do scale dot minor. I'm feeling minor pentatonic today. Pentatonic. Pentat yeah, okay. I spelled that right. 50 dot MIDI CPS. So now we're live coding. Um, ah, that's not right. Yeah, I converted it to CPS and then added 0 or 12, so I was changing the value in hertz. 
but I want to make this octave change before we convert to MIDI CPS. Okay, so now let's get kind of funky here. And the carrier will be the frequency, then we'll do uh, freak divided by two, and the index of modulation one. Ah, that is some lovely FM. It's technically PM, but we're gonna call it FM. Okay, I want to see if I can remember how to do a little bit of reverb. I'm just going to turn that down so I can hear myself think. I don't want to get rid of it. Um, so, oh, you know what else I want to do? No, okay, one thing at a time. Uh, so we'll make ourselves a, a reverb bus. two channels, and I think I could make an end def here. So we'll do gverb.ar. This is going to be reading. No, we don't need all this stuff. We can just plop it right in. in.ar bus verb bus number of channels two room size 200 reverb time three i think and before we let's let's do um let's just play it give it i guess we'll give it a fade time and then we're gonna do we're going to make it. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why we get this. I don't think it's that big of a deal. So now what I think we want to do, we can we can go ndef a dot play n play n. Let's look at um, node proxy. allows you to play to an array of outputs. So we want to go to zero and one and verb bus dot index happens to have index eight and verb bus dot index. No, wait, I, this is what I did. Yeah, we're going to add one. So it's going to play to these four buses. We might only need zero and verb bus. I think I'm going to go with that. That seems likely. And then amplitude. So we'll go full amplitude to that one. Less amplitude to the reverb. All right. Fingers crossed. Oh, I did need all of them. Because now I only have the left speaker. So let's do this. Index plus one. Oh, no. Uh, comma. not balanced something is I'm gonna clear this for a second so we do this huh oh I see what I'm doing I need I need <laughs> my amplitudes are screwed up. I need 1 and 1 and 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. Cool. 
Question is though, are we getting reverb? Start over here. Actually, what we can do, I just uh, end f dot all dot do clear all the end f's. Just start over. Start our clock. We've got our this bus, our that bus. Start that. Start this one. And okay, verb bus. And I did play this, I think, but you want to play it to bus zero, just to be sure. Ah, all right, so that worked. I don't know quite what I did differently. There we go. Oh, I like that. Let's make another um, end def here. One more. Let's make some some like hi hat noise or something. Uh, let's do play n, and we're gonna just. Copy this. And now, to give it some information, whoa, okay, losing my mind here. Uh, white noise. Sig does not equal NDEF. Yeah, it's been a long semester. This is not that annoying to listen to. Usually my biggest problem with live coding is that you're typing something and you're just getting so sick of what you're doing. You know, you just got to change it, but you're, that's what you're doing. You're typing, trying to change it, but I'm okay with this. Um, all right. Did I forget anything? Pan amp gate. It should be. That's what I'm hoping for. That's good stuff.
If I could only type. do something clever here. Um, what if I did this? Yeah. Now I got two of them. I don't hear reverb on NDFC. This might be an order of execution thing that I'm overlooking. I thought NDF took care of that, but um, maybe not.
I think what we can do is we can clear it over five seconds. That'll fade out the high-pitched one. Oh, yeah, yeah. The node tree looks like this. I can't decipher it. I don't really know what's going on. Um, yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry. I, I, anyway, I've just lost in live coding world. Uh, the channel you linked to some crazy stuff with modulo logic to determine if node should be equal. Yeah. I, I glanced at that, too. I think... Um, there's there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, I mean the resolutions. It's not. Uh, can I pick a? Yeah, it's maybe a little bit better. But yeah, there's there's some stuff going on here. He has these functions tilde tg, tilde. I don't know if you can see this tilde tc, tilde gate, and this allows him to in in the end f's below to quickly evaluate stuff about how to subdivide the beat and produce triggers from that it's because it's it's uh it's more sophisticated than my version where i'm just i just have two clocks to choose from an impulse generator which is doing quarter notes and one which is doing 16th notes and i i actually haven't taken a close look at the modulo stuff um yeah, and if I were to change the TX brand, there's the TX brand in the white noise generator. If this was LF noise one, then yeah, it would just, it would, I mean, the envelope would still be controlled. It would still just be, but the actual frequencies would be changing randomly with linear interpolation in the background. So like, that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, so because all all, uh, all my wonderful students are working on their final projects, uh, I'm not planning on <laughs> streaming next week, which is the last day of classes. Uh, and unfortunately, this might be it for the live streams for a while. Uh, I've had I've had some fun doing this. This has been good, and I I will definitely teach this class again. It's not entirely sure when exactly, but uh, I mean if the if the feedback is good on the course evaluations, if, if people like this, I, I'd be happy to do it again. And I imagine I'd probably end up covering a lot of the same content. So if you've seen it once, you know I don't know how useful it'll be on the rewatch, but. Um, yeah, and, and next semester I'm teaching this interactive music programming course. Uh, any chance of just live coding streams? Uh, you know, maybe. I I need to get good first. Like I, it's it, when I mean get good, I mean two things. I mean make the music more interesting instead of just minor pentatonic for days. You know, find find ways to get creative with it, and uh also get better at all of the nuances of the syntax and the language and frankly if i really want to commit to live coding i'm probably going to branch out to something which is more streamlined for live coding i'm really interested in sonic pi and i'm also interested in fox dot and title cycles and that's sort of a summer project for me um and parmar the reason next semester is not going to be live streamed is because of the way I'm structuring the course. 
uh, the, the there's at the beginning before spring break, the first half of the semester, there's going to be four module assignments, uh, and they're going to involve the Keith McMillan Q Neo, Touch OSC running on an iPhone, PlayStation Four controllers, and Arduino. Those are the four modules. Each of those will be a two-week assignment, just like getting it up and running, getting some basic interactive sound happening. And because I I don't have like a PlayStation 4 controller for everybody, I don't have a Keith McMillan for everybody, uh, It's I, I'm necessarily going to have to put like a quarter of the class on module A, a quarter on B, a quarter on C and D, and then every two weeks rotate. So if on the first day I stream Arduino, there's going to be three quarters of the class who are not working on Arduino at that point in time. They're working on something else. And so, you know, I can't, I, I guess I could do one long video talking about all four of those, but that sounds kind of exhausting. So what I'm going to do instead is make four brief videos, sort of more tutorial style, not live streamed. Um, uh, and um, and those will just be available at the beginning of the semester. And that'll be, I'll make those public too. I mean, not everybody has a Keith McMillan controller or a PlayStation 4 controller, but just in the interest of making my teaching public, I think I'll, I'll do that. But yeah, I, I just don't, I can't really see a weekly live stream fitting in with that class in a natural way. But I mean, yeah, road to getting good at live coding on stream might be good. I mean, the problem is I, I have a full-time job and a life and things to do. I'm not a full-time streamer and I have no aspirations to be a full-time streamer. Um, and as, as much as it pains me to say it, I can't like drop everything and just commit to a few hours of streaming whenever I feel like it, especially if we're like mid-semester. I mean, over the summer, I can definitely see some live streams sort of getting good at code. Um, I mean, if I was trying to make it as a streamer, then hell yeah, I'd be streaming all the time. Um, but I see this as sort of like a supplement to my university teaching and yeah. So I, I'll, I'll put that on the docket. Uh, maybe even over winter break, I'll do a little something, but I think there's going to be too much prep going on for the spring classes. It's a short break. It's only like five weeks or something. And I'm going to be out of town for like one of those five weeks, but maybe over the summer, I'll do some more live streaming, practice live coding. I mean, yeah, if you, if you guys are down to watch me clunk around with live coding and just be back on the struggle bus, like programming is all, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll be down to stream that. It's just uh, get ready for me to look like the biggest dummy in the world again. I mean, like it's starting something new. It's like, I just want to do this basic thing and I have no idea how to do it. So it's kind of frustrating, but you know, that's life's all about challenging yourself and trying new things. All right. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it for tonight. A little bit of DAW integration, a little bit of live coding. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm scrolling here, here we are at the top. I, in fact, while I'm here, I'll just like paste bin this right quick, just so, uh, if anyone wants to just copy this, you can. Oh yeah, it's my pleasure. So there's a paste bin for you all to chew on. That's just everything you see in front of you here. So this has been a fun semester for me. I, I I'm into live coding. Keeps me entertained. Um so yeah, so to all of my 499C students, uh tomorrow we're going to do course evaluations and also I encourage you all to I think I sent I sent out an announcement about this. Just bring your live bring, not your live streams. Bring your final projects in progress and come with questions and code that may or may not be working and we'll sort of talk through it and um, that'll be our last in-class meeting 
and I'll just be available from then until the final project presentation date to help you out with anything. So, right. Yeah, you are welcome, my friends. So I guess I'll sign off, and it's been a pleasure live streaming to all of you wonderful people. And I guess I'll I'll see you all around. So thanks again for watching. Take care.